Just give me a second. I'll just pick it up. For the primary location, we are we are setting up the logistics. And meanwhile, feel free to take a small break. Yeah. Oh. Yep. <laughs> so this is a Yes. We are leaving from this camera. Yes. Okay, so we'll probably get started for the Bangalore location. Every hi everyone again. Um, so good afternoon. Welcome back to the next set of sessions. And for the next set of sessions, we do have speakers in different regions. And of course, uh, we will continue in the Exosort office here in Bangalore. And with us, um, we have Saurav Raj joining us. So Saurav Raj is a founder of WISE. It's a tokenization as a service solution uh, for business application um, company. So he, I mean, talking about his personal profile, he's an alumnus of IIT Delhi. And that's not it. He is also uh, uh, completed his management development program from IIM Lucknow. And that's not very famous as well. He's also first rank holder in uh, SP Jain management um, in, in a financial technology program at SP Jain uh, management, global management uh, uh, institute. So he's very much active in Web3 ecosystem, Web3 space, and um, Oh, today he's here with us talking about this uh, tokenization use case. And uh, yeah, so if you have any questions, even the virtual audience, if you have any questions uh, to ask to Saurav, feel free to uh, ask those questions. And uh, welcome, Saurav. It's, it's an honor to have you here with us. And I just heard from Jay that you came all the way from Mumbai. It's, that just makes it so special for us. Yeah. Don't worry. Next time we invite everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so I know how to go to Sarah. Yeah. So, so I can stand here. Or... So, so you can. This people can see you if you want to come to the site. <laughs> and I can navigate the slides for you. Let me know when and I'll keep switching. Okay. Um, You're here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So a tip on the conference, are you guys able to hear us well from the Bangalore office? Can someone say yes, thumbs up, anything we do? 
Yeah, we can hear. Thank you. Thank you. Well, got it. Okay, so thank you for the wonderful introduction. And again, I apologize team and Bangalore team here uh, for the, you know this opportunity. The idea is that I can share something which I have learned over this you know past several months to over a year uh, in this domain, which will give you some perspective of all the cool stuff that people talked about in building technology, interledger protocols, sharing of data, and how you could actually uh, use it to bring uh, applications, bring use cases to life. Right? So that is what we talked about. Um, so the theme is building trust for a decentralized world. Like everyone it likes decentralization moving forward, and that is what we'll talk about. But as soon as you decentralize things, you, you tend to not know who the other person is, but you still need to be able to trust them to do a transaction. And that is what we find out how you can actually do that. So yeah, let's go to the next. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So this is my brief introduction. I will get wonderful part. Uh, but but yes, see my kind of experience today. Uh, if if someone can read it out, what it says on the on the top. Over there. You're an astronaut, freelance. Right. <laughs> so this is interesting. Right? And this is this is actually my LinkedIn page. So if you scan this QR, it takes you to my LinkedIn page, and that is what I can go and write saying I'm, I'm an astronaut at the Hyperledger India chapter. <laughs> now that sounds very good. But I know it is not correct. He knows it's not correct. Everyone in the room knows it's not correct. And this is the problem with everything that exists in social media today, everything that you put out today. You really don't know what the other person can write. So how do you trust what the other person is saying? How do you know actually if someone's saying they are someone or they have a certain degree or they have a certain credential, it is actually correct. And that is where we'll understand how tokenization, in fact, can actually help us do that. By the way, the rest of it was correct. <laughs> so, brief introduction. Now comes the actual introduction. So, this is we we have done quite a bit of work. If you go and read, you'll see where all you can you know, after the event as well. You can see where all tokenization can be useful. Uh, we pitched it to uh, the uh, EdTech Startup Challenge. It's the Academy of Credentials. They they give us an award for that. They're part of the National Deep Tech Club as well, which is now with uh, here in Bangalore, and that is. Uh, presenting at the Dell Technologies Forum, where it was how do we tokenize a world credentials for the gig economy. Now, a bunch of people come and deliver stuff to your house. I mean, you have Zomato guys, you have Swiggy guys, you have Ola car drivers. How do you actually know that you know that guy is actually a Swiggy guy? And you and I all have LinkedIn, so you know, fancy resumes and online photos, but those guys who are delivering food at your places, who are delivering stuff, medicines, I mean, they don't have any LinkedIn, so they don't have anything, right? How do you make sure they get credited for their work history? So tomorrow, if they have to go and apply for a loan, they can actually prove to someone that, hey, I worked in Swiggy for 12 months. I took a three-month break, and then I joined Firka, and I'm doing a good job. Here, my, here is my customer reviews, so I, I'm eligible to get a loan. Because those guys, because they are on contract, they don't have a work history. Their education certificate or somewhere else. They cannot actually prove they're financially marginalized. So this is where a technology like this can actually help them Get to that point where they will be included. What we talk about financial inclusion, that's something which you can help. Issuing tokens is very easy, it is actually more economical, cost effective, and time saving than actually issuing them <clears throat> a letter which they might eventually lose over time. But a token created on the block exists forever, and that is the beauty of the solution that we're going to talk about. Right, so to break it up, what we will talk about is public statement solution. Who talked in or not who talked in? Why? Uh, tokenization and NFTs. Uh, then we'll talk about some of the business applications. Look at various use cases around the world, some of the very popular ones, and you will see what actually is happening out there. In the applications, a lot of people say crypto regulations, government, XYZ, but we will see, yes, it's still possible. We are actually doing it, and you can do it. And that should open up your ideas to actually, if we can do this today. Where are, you know, when you step out of this room today evening over this weekend, you should be able to think, where can I now take this forward? Where can I, whatever I've learned at the hyperledger tech test today, I can go to my school, college, university, you know, workplace, where can I use it? Right? And finally, get time to do it. So, like I said, the main problem we are trying to solve, every blockchain company, everyone in the world is trying to solve the problem of trust, right? Trust actually is what it is. And, and it can open up lots of opportunities if you can actually trust who the person is. 
You go to a bank because you trust the bank, right? You've come here because you trust Michael Dell, right? It's as simple as that. If it was not XYZ India chapter, you would not be here today on a Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, right? And, and this is the problem, but if you don't know, then we do not have trust. Right? So what we are looking for is trust, which is a firm belief that someone actually is who they are and they are actually what they say they are and how to do that. And actually what you're looking for is this green, green ticks everywhere. You look at the chat applications, you look at the bank everywhere. If you have a green tick like this, you know it's good. I can do that. If you have a red tick, you're not. So the entire world, not only India, everywhere in the world, you are looking for those green ticks. And the blockchain, whatever it is doing, evidently, end of the day, it is solving for the trust factor. Consensus protocols, everything, which is the core of what blockchain does, it is solving for trust. It is not solving for speed, efficiency, those are extra things that make it more viable. At the core of it, every blockchain is solving for this trust. So, as you move, now we talked about decentralization, right? So now you see we talked about data ownership in your hands. The CBDC is out there, you can have your own wallet, you know, you can sell it to anyone you like, right? So if you break it down, your footprint, you know, actual, how much and how many types of data you have, we have we see that. A typical normal individual can have data spread across your identity, which is your national ID, spam card, a card, a social security number, driver license, you know, all sorts of things, right? Then your academics or your certificates from school, college, sport, you know, all these things you do, right? You, have, you might have a bundle. I have a bundle at home, but I cannot show it very much. I cannot carry it. But if these were as tokens, I could actually show, show it on my mobile screen and I could give you a link, a QR code, which you can actually go and verify, right? Those are all academics. Work in it, you talked about it. Financial, if you have a loan or you don't have a loan, you have insurance, right? I mean, you go someone hits your car, you say, I need to claim insurance, but you know if the other person can support it or not, right? Those kind of things. The medical, your medical data is very valuable. Today, you go to hospitals, pharmacies, everywhere, they take your name, details, everything, they know what medicines you're having. That data, believe it or not, if you look up the internet, it's all being channelized, going back to research, people are making a bunch of money out of it, and you're still falling sick. That's the one part of it, right? So how do you do that, right? Assets. You drive in a car, you drive in a bike, you have a fridge, you have a TV, you have ACs, you have houses, you have your apartments, right? I mean, those are all physical assets. You want to buy a house from someone else, how do you know that person actually has a house? I'll tell you in my own society in Mumbai. I, I went to the office one day and there's this guy fighting with the you know society, you know, people, right? And saying, you know, this parking, right? This is the issue was parking. And the actual owner of the parking was also there. He's saying this parking is mine. I've been living in this society for the last 15 years. And this new guy was coming and said, hey, I was sold this parking by this guy you know, just two months back. So someone sold you a parking which is not about belong to it, right? And that is the problem with assets, right? There's a lot of problem with real estate assets, with a lot of other assets as well, right? And finally, social, important, very, very important, right? The social engagements. Once you move out, move out of your college, universities, everything, and people know you are. I mean, today we are in a social setting, right? I mean, typically, right? We know each other because we are members of uh, the high college media chapter. Right? We're sitting here in Bangalore. So those are two social factors which actually define our engagements with each other. I might go and meet someone at a nice mall. I say, hey, I, I met you at the Hyperledger India chapter. That's a social interaction, right? But someone can come and wearing a nice, uh, you know, Hyperledger Foundation t shirt. Is that guy from Hyperledger India chapter? Maybe not. So that is how you can organize those things your gym membership, right? Your club membership. And that's actually where you can build more value out of this. And using that, you can build additional use cases. You can build more value. You can deliver more value to the user of the world. So, end of the day, agent of trust is blockchain, right? And not only I say, not only hyperledger says, but everyone sort of agrees over the last several years that blockchain is going to be the agent of trust. And that is why this is going to be a foundational technology. It is as good as you can think your Java, JavaScript, PHP, HTML, CSS. This is what is going to be the language of the future, right? If you're building applications of future, as people are solving for speed, for throughput, for interoperability, we saw all those very cool examples. This will become the foundational technology. So for you, for everyone out there, you should be investing time in this. Right? So coming to the business side of it, right? And what is where, what you can do, and where opportunities lie for everyone of you, right? The stack is complex. We know that. It is very, very complicated. And that is why not many people are actually using it. They're still learning. It is evolving, right? And on top of that, tokenization, which is NFTs. Everyone understands NFT here, right? I mean, you've done that. Tokenization, so okay, so I'll skip that. It is hard to manage. So you have the blockchain stack on top of your NFT. How do you manage that, right? 
right? And how you ensure that the data contained in the NFT is still, you know, sacrosanct, it's still, you know, uh, obviously encrypted. So not everyone can use it depending on the type of use case, right? And finally, what happens is you spend a lot of time in this, you lose entry to time to market, right? So that's again, if your business is, you know, it's very competitive, right? Two pharma companies, they want to launch a product, they want to go to the market fast, they don't want to sell and do a lot of research. For them, it is market customers, right? They don't want to do research. At Hyperledger Labs, they are happy to do research. Right? That is good. But when it goes out of business, it's fast. It needs time to market. Right? So, so this is where what, what we have done is compressed all of that, remove the challenges and say, we'll make Web3 accessible. We'll make this infrastructure accessible. Now, when you talk to businesses, the first question they will ask is, you're nice, you good guys, you're learning Web3, you're doing blockchain. What will happen tomorrow? You change your idea. And you start to say, hey, I want to open a nice fancy store, right? What happens to my data? What is the first answer? Is the biggest answer which you go and tell every company, if you're going to build a startup, invest your blog, you say, your data is sitting on blockchain, it is permanent. It does not get deleted. It is better than an existing database which you have. This is a this is a winning solution. This is the magic wonder. These three points, four points, memorize it, it will win you every client. It's simple. That is how I have been winning clients. And converted them to Web3 for the last 12 months. So, life and data assurance, it is not 99.9%, .9%, it is 100% as long as a single node on the network is running. Your data is available to you, Mr. Customer. I go away, you can come in, you can build the protocol, you can read the data back. It is never lost. This is a beautiful statement. The second is availability. As long as the nodes keep running, blockchain is running, fairly decentralized, there is no downtime, right? That is another good thing. Finally, you can write APIs. We saw there is three layers and all the stuff. That those technologies are available today. You can give this data back to their CRM. They all love their CRMs. You cannot tell them, sir, come to Hyperledger, come to build on this blockchain. No, they will never come. But the moment you say, yes, I will do this. And if you need, I can plug the data back to your CRM. They'll be very happy. They'll say, come, please have a seat. Tell us how we can do it. These three points, that's it. And if they're still not convinced, you tell them infrastructure cost. Many of this, you know, by, by community models, this is already available out of the box. You go and deploy on top of them, right? They'll give you a lot of credits. You know, many companies do that. They promote development. So today, cost. And at, at this point number four, the customer is already with you, right? So if you want to actually do that, these are the good things. And finally, because it's NFT, you know, it comes with nice image and stuff. You cannot actually give someone a blockchain hash or a transaction number. It's this big, a lot of numbers, characters, and family. That doesn't work. But the moment you put an NFT on top of it, it is visualizable, right? Imagine the difference between having a UPI ID and giving someone your bank account an IFC number to make a transaction. Imagine the difference. Today, no one talks about, I'll give you my bank account, IFC number, my branch is here, please verify, go into internet banking. You say, hey, I'm not doing that, give me a UPI ID. That is the difference between a blockchain transaction and when you put an NFT on top of it, Visualization. So now you can actually see here, feel because NFTs can be images, it can be videos, it can be audios, it can be anything. So that form factor. UPI is nothing. I mean, it's the same. The transaction is still going to the bank, but the form factor has changed from NEFT, RTGS to IMPS. Form factor has changed in, U in UPI. That is what makes it very, very powerful. And now almost everyone in India is using that. That is what NFTs do to block blockchain transactions. It makes it seeable. I can see it, I can feel it, I can send it, I can give it to someone. That is what it makes it up. And of course, because it is there, it is tamper proof and very tamper. So when I talked about I'm an astronaut, because that token is not issued by Hyperledger India chapter, it cannot be verified, which means that it's incorrect. Simple. The question ends there. You don't have to go to anyone. You can verify the data on chain. You don't even have to go to Hyperledger. You don't have to come to me. You can actually verify it independent of everyone. And that is the power of blockchain. That is the power of tokenization and decentralization. These are the premises. This is the winning slide on baking Web3 when you want to talk to anyone, right? So how did it come about? So initially, before everything started, we just had identity, which is an account of wallet. You had smart contracts, which is the rules of what I give to you, what I take from you, right? Or what are you giving me? And then you had a payment, which is a transaction which actually does some deal to deals. And then something revolutionary happened, which is uh, then you had digital assets. Virtual digital assets, we call it. These are the NFTs that we talked about, right? And when these came, it changed the game everywhere. It, it was it was a big change. 
and, and, and that is where people got interested in blockchain. That is where a bunch of artists came, a bunch of creators came, who had nothing to do with blockchain. Before this, blockchain was just for each nerd like you and me, and that's all. They were happy with it. We were very happy. This is just about three to four years back. No one, yeah, people really just happy with it was their idea, with the idea of back then. But when these digital assets came and NFTs came, it changed the game, right? Everyone started to hear about it, right? People are talking in Twitter spaces, people are talking about it. WhatsApp knows people you don't even think they have any technical knowledge, they are talking about blockchain today. That is the power of what digital assets and NFTs have done. So, where do we go? This is 2014, like I said, now blockchain has been there around 2007 and 8, probably 2014. This was the first NFT minted, and this is historical, right? And this is very funny, and the reason why I say this is, well, of course, it was sold for 1.4 million dollars. Uh, the graphics not there, but this is just like a blue circles. It's very psychedelic, you know, and, and all that stuff, fancy. But that is the first NFT recorded in the human history, and it is just that it's, it's a JPEG, like right? just fancy. You can you can make this kind of in your computer screen if you're a uh, math lab, you know, for a guy. Right? So this was the first NFT done. And there was a problem with that, right? What happened is today, if you have bought an internet domain, you know that you go to e or Namecheek or anyone you go, you have to kind of renew that domain every two years, three years, right? Otherwise, you lose the license, it goes back to the registry. So back then, when he did this NFT, he did not know what to do with NFT. No one knew what NFTs were. So he left it. It was similar like a domain kind of system. So the chain on which it was created, he left it there. He did not renew the license. So when a major auction house wanted to sell it, the question came is who is the owner? Is it this guy Kevin, or is the guy who is actually owning that uh, you know the, the network, right? But they circled it because that is the people were mature, people were smart, and that is how finally it was sold for 1.47 million dollars. But this raises the question exactly which we talk about is ownership, and that is why NFTs are so powerful because they help you to establish ownership. Ownership could be of anything, could be of this chair, could be of this fridge, could be of your house, apartment, your credentials, your certificate, anything. And that is why NFTs are very, very powerful. Let's look at some more use cases. Again, this guy, a very little use case. Now, super yachts, you see in those fancy movies, James Bond and everything, people are running, you know, yachts, very rarely they get blown up. Cars get blown up, bikes get blown up, everything. Yachts don't get blown up so easily, right? I mean, it's all CGI, it actually does. So what do they do? It takes a lot of money to build these because these are very fancy, very, you know, exclusive. And it's a lot of money, right, for anyone to start building and then think I'll go and sell it to someone. But what he did is actually he flipped the model. He said, I will make an NFT out of the entire year and I'll give it to everyone. Which means I'll take money today and later on, I'll tell you when the yacht is ready, I'll give you invite to the fancy parties. You're like, hey, yes, I'm, I'm happy now. I'll give you the money now. And in six months time, when the yacht is ready, I'll get to go to a party. And this is where you see the business economic model changed. Using this, now you can go and tell someone, I'll give you an NFT for my company or something, or a product which I'm going to build, or a software application I'm going to sell. But buy now, buy take my NFTs, and I'll give this to you later. If you're an artist or a creator, you can say, Hey, I'm doing an art project which is very fancy, I'm creating a movie, but I need funds now. I'll give you the premiere of the movie, you'll be the first one to see the movie, or you'll get an exclusive first price to buy out of my entire 10,000 you know, images that I create, and then I'll give it to the normal public. That's exclusiveness. That is what people will buy for. That is where they'll take your NFTs. And that is where the economic model starts to make sense, right? And these NFTs were sold for $12 million. So imagine, you can raise as much money using these models, which typically before, you had to go to a bank, take a loan, do all sorts of things, and then do it, right? So it changes the economic model system. So this is very, very interesting. Again, this is an example from India. Different, different uh, company, different application, right? So what they did is, is one of the most popular ones. Each of these four JPEGs, it's a, it's a Jeep, which the Mahindra company makes, right? So four JPEGs, this was all of this, started with an initial bid price of one lakh each. It was finally sold for 26 lakhs total. So from four lakhs to 26 lakhs. And what they did was not use it for profit, they actually gave all of this to a non-profit organization for supporting uh, education for uh, uh, small girls, right? So imagine the use case it was used for CSR, right? So we talked about NFTs tokenization using for profit. This is an example used for, uh, you know, actually for a non-profit and for uh, social, you know, benefit, right? Again, this is very popular in India. I mean, if you don't talk about cricket, it doesn't work. 
This is one of the examples. This is from Dario, right? And these are friends of mine. He's, he's actually a batchmate of mine, right? He's just quite a billion, uh, I think, 120 million in funding as well. And what they do is these are player cards, right? So fifty dollar fee, sixty dollar fee, stuff like that. But what's the difference? You have, I can go. I can. I'm watching the actual match on my, you know, uh, some OTT app. I can take a print screen, and you know, I have. But actually, you don't because you don't have that record created on blockchain saying you actually own it. Versus if I have bought these, which are licensed by the cricket board in Australia, in India, then actually I have that. And what happens is it might even look the same as something if you have taken a screenshot, right? But let's say these guys say that, hey, you know, Australia team comes to India and say we are doing the tour of India, we're in Bangalore, but everyone who has NFT can come to an evening social dinner. Then if I have the actual NFT from this, I can actually go to the event because they can verify it. Versus someone who's taken a screenshot, it won't get verified, they will not get admission. You see, there's a very clear difference. People will ask you many times, I do the NFT, but I can take a screenshot. Yes, you can take a screenshot, it looks the same, but when you verify it, it fails. And that is where the proof of the ownership, proof of the trust is, right? So this is one that again, moving forward, very popular one. Amitabh Bachchan did NFT sold for a couple of uh, you know hundred thousands of dollars. Very unique. Again, show the picture. It's still people love to see it, you know, or sell in individually autograph both of them. I mean, you can feel it if you really like what millions, right? I mean, later on you can sell it, these things no good on the value. Here, exclusive scarcity drives more value. It's like you know, having a fresh life, right? And, and, and these are the things. Again, more on the utility side, you probably, if you Google this, you'll see that Starbucks has already launched this program now. Uh, I, I think, uh, and what they're doing is if you have an NFT, then you will get exclusive member benefits. You might have access to certain coffee brands or something. Let's say it's a very rare uh, item of coffee, only 10,000 in the world. Let's say everyone who has NFT will get the first chance to buy it, right? This kind of thing. So you are kind of a token, it's called token gating, right? You're putting a gate to saying everyone has a token, they come forward and they will have access to certain benefits, right? And this is one of the best use cases to build on. Like, you know, this is very, very popular. Again, uh, uh, Shopify, many of you know about it, you might be building on it. What they did is for their uh, merchants who are actually live on the platform, they have given a similar thing that you can make your own NFTs and you can do a Kind of you know, flip card first days or Amazon Prime, you know, you get 24 hours. You can do that with this. If you have a limited product, you can give to your NFT first members and then kind of go on to the rest. But you see, it's going mainstream, it's actually being used. And, and then, you know, again, supporting artists, right? No one, no one really goes to artists like see a painting and uh, some very good ones I saw here, right? But but then what Gucci did was they put a $25,000 into it and they said this stuff going to art museums, which can be very, very costly. And, you have to wait for months to actually get a spot. We'll build you a virtual experience where you can sell your digital art. So you see how it is getting more and more democratic. Everyone can now do it, right? So that's again a very good example. Right? And finally, coming to a very crucial fact, which is this is fancy, this is good technology, but does it work? Is it acceptable? If if I get a challenge, if I get an issue with my NFT, can I go to the court of law? Now, not yet, not in every country today, but it is going to come. This probably is one of the first examples where it says that NFT is to be treated as a virtual property, which means it will have rights assigned to it. If I have it, it has rights. If I transfer it to him, if I transfer it to you, you will have certain rights which get transferred along the way, right? And, and actually, if you see, there are very clear definition of you know what those rights could be. So, and actually, it's a good thing that you go to point telegraph and give those terms very, very well written, right? So, because the reason to bring this up is when you go and talk to a business or we you try to fill up because people will ask, does it work, right? Is it valuable? Why should I just do it, right? If it's not like that, you say, this is why it's just to work. So they have done it. I believe in Singapore, there was a case, it was said similarly. In India, as much time as people are working towards it, right? And at some point time it will become valid. So you could sell your apartment as an NFT, and that would mean an actual transfer of you know apartment has been happened, right? So be very careful in future, don't just send out an NFT to anyone, right? You might actually send them something with you. Right? So, so coming on to the last part of it, India applications, right? You see already Maharashtra has done diplomas on blockchain. They have issued some uh, car certificates on this. Now, education certificate we talked about. I mean, you guys are pretty much well-read, well-studied. You don't need to worry about it, but there are many, it is a big market out there, right? You could do fake certificates, which is no. I'll tell you my experience, and this is this, and this is the reason why actually one of the reasons why I got into this. 
Way back when I was starting to build uh, with Hyper Leather, I wanted to hire a team. So I went on LinkedIn, typical place, right? Uh, and, and, and looked at some profiles, you know, uh, you know, and, and I saw uh, this, this, this one person writing so many LinkedIn articles, following, commenting, and I thought maybe yeah, there's a good response, like there's a social proof, this person knows something. So we did a discussion, uh, even made an offer, the offer was accepted, then came holiday season, so we said, okay, you come and join after the holidays, you start after the holidays. Now, three weeks later, the first task was very simple, give me a basic hyperledger fabric architecture to deploy an application. So three weeks later, I still did not get anything at all, nothing. When I pushed too much, I got an Excel sheet, I was like, man, this Excel sheet is what actually extends your requirements. And then I figured out, this person does not know anything about hyperledger. But then in writing a lot of blogs and posts and everything and making comments and everyone else, maybe there's a comment on Arun's post as well. <laughs> to gain popularity that, hey, I'm replying to Arun's post and maybe Arun liked it. So I go and look, hey, I know Arun. Arun is a good, reputable guy. This person is, you know, replying to Arun's post, which means this person knows what type of is. So I made an offer. Hi, gave money also. Nothing, zero. That's not anything. So I had to say, please leave. You are actually, you know, you can't do anything. I don't have to say you're fired. You should actually accept that you're fired and just leave and don't show up. Anymore. That is when I realized that there's a big problem out there. And that is because of that, right? So, so trust is, is very, very important, right? And, and then, of course, the rest of it is there. So education, we talked about email consensus. A lot of it happens now. Actually, very fine tickets, right? Today, a lot of people can show QR codes and enter, right? But how do you know that QR code actually is correct, right? And you can say, hey, you know, your application is not working. And you've seen those famous ads, right? Someone drives very fast through the police. Police says 200. The, and he says, drive again. He says, again, go same path. Say, hey, your machine is wrong. I'm driving within speed limits. So if you share the, show the same QR code, say, hey, you know, your machine is really not, I need to go to a movie, but that is not correct, right? So those tickets are issued as NFTs on blockchain, which means it's permanent. Now here's the interesting thing which you can do. Now, let's say I do an event and I invite all of you and you have an NFT sitting out. And then Arun here uh, invites all of you and says, I want to only invite people who were at that event. He doesn't have to come and ask me because it is already created as a token. He can go and read the token data and he can send out an invite to all of you. Or he can say, well, you come to the event, but your samosas are going to be 100 rupees. But if you were at that event, which I can know because I know from your token data, you don't have to prove anything to me, I will give you the samosas for free. And maybe 12 months down the line, Hyperledger India will say that, hey, if you're coming to my regular meetups and meetings and I can record them as NFTs and I can record all the transactions, you'll get an event for free or lunch for free or whatever is there. I don't know what it could be. But if you're not coming and if you just shown up today for the free lunch, well, you have to pay. This is where the idea is to motivate people to actually be part of the community, contribute, learn also, and be present, right? And this is where a lot of developer communities going forward will change. I already know from some of the discussions that I've been having that people are trying to look at this model, right? And, and some of these examples are uh, uh, already not in the, in, the, in the blockchain world, but even outside as well, right? So, for example, how many, how many of you know DIE? Type, right? Some of you may be members, as students, or you might actually join them. So, for with Type Bank, we are actually working on a project where your membership data will be tokenized. Now, what happens is it's a very actual use case, and I can, I think, talk about it. Uh, people get the membership for one year, they don't pay for the second year, it's very typical with, as, as Indians, we think Iqbal Lilia, it's for lifetime, right? It's very standard. <laughs> so, so what happens is they put it on LinkedIn, but that's incorrect data, right? You are giving. So what we are saying is that membership token will get, uh, will be tokenized, which means if the next year you're not paying your membership fees, then the token will be getting deactivated, which means anything you try to get on the base of the token will say invalid token. So which means you can renew your membership or actually you can pay for the item, right? So this is where, you know, without passing Excel sheets, without checking, without doing lookup, simple scan the NFT or the token, and you know if it is valid or invalid, right? So that is how it's going to be. And what can I see your data to try to ask you that? So, so going next, yes, that was the uh, the next one is the membership which I was talking about, right? So this is actually active. And as long as you, if you're not renewed, you can change the visuals of it. You can say it's membership it, it ship is inactive. Automated completely smart contracts, you don't have to touch a single thing. They transfer perpetuity. As a user, no excuses. And I said, my payment did not work, my this did not work. 
You make the payment today, it's very streamlined, so that will make you make a payment. It becomes active again. Don't do the payment if you don't renew your membership because of that. Very simple. Now, this is an example. The reason why I showed it is you can actually build on this, pick up hyperizer fabric or you know, uh, ENFT uh, minting engine or any of these. Go back there, a bunch of you know, subscription services, chains, clubs. Go build the solutions and sell it out to them. You'll actually start making money today, right? Actually, good applications of blockchain technology and Bangalore is the tech capital of India, right? So, this is the place where it should happen, right? That is why I actually was away from that, right? So, now you know. Good. So, this is another application from a supply chain perspective, right? Which is getting real time status of inventory, who has how much inventory. You get this status updated. You know, sort of is a very good example of one of the oldest projects in the hyperledger chain. So I'll not spend a lot of time on this. So this is actually what you can do. And all the rest of the integrations, you can have it, right? So you build the user interface, the backend is the centerpiece of it. It's a blockchain where you sit and you have data which you can rely on, right? So based on that data, now you can see who needs to get full inventory, or if that person is saying, hey, you know, I have so much inventory, I need a loan from a bank to manage this all, you know, raise capital. You now businesses need to do that. They can actually do on the basis of that because otherwise there's no proof that you have so much inventory, right? So that is what actually you can use it for. So these are actual applications. Uh, let's go next. Again, some of the new ones coming. Healthcare, we talked about real estate. Uh, it is one of the most difficult ones because there's a lot of regulation, a lot of fraud also happens, right? Which is one of the slowest ones. But what I'm doing is I believe very positively, and, and I may be wrong, but most likely in 2023 you start to see tokenization happening in real estate, which means, let's say this was an entire office, you know, all of us could have like one, I don't know, one block like this, one of the office, and then you can rent out the office to someone else, and whatever the rental money comes, everyone starts to get it, right? I was at some point of time, started my new job, went to Mumbai, real estate prices are here, my salary was always here. And that is typical, right? That is typical to any big city, you want to go and work, you come from anywhere, House, home is here, your salary is here. You never make enough, right? Until, until you reach a certain point. It's the fact of life. But what if now you have that amount of money with fractionalization, you can start putting it in different places, right? So you can invest, invest, invest. Instead of putting in stock markets or mutual funds or something, you can actually invest in real house in a property somewhere. And less than five years' time down the line, you can actually buy enough shares to actually hold uh, by the entire unit. That could be possible, right? So this is making actually a dream come so real estate will come, people do it today. There's a lot of challenges around it, but it still happens. But blockchain will kind of revolutionize it. Outside some places do it. Dubai, I think, is one of the good examples, but India also will catch up to it and then you will see happening. Organic farming, I think hyperledger is a very new specific style of that is supply chain again gets done, does it one of the four solutions. So I'll give that a But these are solutions actually happening, right? It's not fiction, it's not something which is only in presentations. If you go out, research a little bit. And the idea to share all of these is actually that you can step out and if you start thinking of if I want to build a career as a blockchain developer, if I want to do an hyperledger, where will I end up? These are the actual problems. See, these are the problems and solutions which actually impact life, they create value, right? And, and, and you'll make quite a bit, bit of money. So, so that's what I have today. So building trust for the decentralized world that is about to come. It is going to change in ways which we did not know. COVID has actually accelerated a lot of it, right? So that is why we have so many meetups and emails, right? And, and to read more about how it can change, I mean, look it up. There's a bunch of stuff on uh, LinkedIn, you know, uh, you can you can follow and go there and do it, right? That's, that's, I have, that's what I have for today. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you did speak quite a bit about NFT and our work, right? So from my knowledge about NFT, for quite a bit of it, for quite a few hours. But uh, most of the actual artwork is not stored on the blockchain itself because of the space constraints and the artwork that you know, file, the drawing, the fact stored, and some other accounts for it, some center. And the only thing that's actually stored on the blockchain is the transmitter data as such is the link to that particular um, artwork. Right. Um, so if the server has posted the app and then they kind of go down, then all you have will be the document scaling or link to something that doesn't exist. So I mean, I think this is a very common problem that we discussed with people just like um, how the class has like an ownership is actually um that use case is too different to them. Repeat the question. Exactly. So and I didn't get your name, sorry. I'm Deepika. Deepika. So there's a question from Deepika here. 
See, you're saying that a lot of the artwork, you know, digital, it's created a copy. It's stored on a centralized server, could be a cloud server somewhere. And, and the blockchain actually just simply stores a link to that file. At some point or another, that file can be deleted, it can be moved, it can be removed. So how do we manage or ensure that actually the data exists and how do we track the ownership through the transfer process, right? I believe that's the question. So good, that is actually a very good question. And again, fraud has happened in that, right? So people did exactly the same thing. They gave you a link, they created a link to a, a blockchain transaction and said, here is the artwork. And when the artwork was sold, the transaction was done. They deleted, it's like, you, you know, you have a file on Google Drive and you go and delete it. That is called a rug pull. It's a very well-known term in the artwork industry in, in, in NFTs. So if you just Google rug pull, you will see some very good and clear definitions. So it actually happened. And then the industry got together and said, how can we solve this problem? Because end of the day, you have to protect the user interest. Again, going back to the trust, if you have an application where people are doing these things, no one will come to your marketplace. No one will come to your museum or anywhere and say, hey, you know, I get cheated here every time. Going back to the problem of trust we talk about. So how do we fix it? So then, like you have distributed and decentralized blockchains, right, which is the protocol, you have decentralized storage as well. IPFS. Right? So, IPFS. And, and there are solutions out there, right? So what you do is instead of a Google Drive, I mean, you can put the same artwork on a Google Drive, but now if I know it's Google Drive or a, or a AWS link or a Azure link, I will not trust it. I know this can be deleted any time. Yeah, where is the right? Sure, it is an idea. Where would be any indication or any energy that we can Yes, yes. Actually, that's what I'm going to. So, so in terms of storage, that is the one because it's, it's distributed in that sense and you cannot just delete it. Second is that link with IP. So you can actually see it. So where, as, exactly. So as, as soon as you see drive.google.com, you know it's a Google Drive. It can be deleted or you can lose access to it. As soon as you see an IPFS or a you know a decent price store, I think you know it's IPFS. But there are more solutions actually. People do that. Uh, look up this project now called Lighthouse, right? Which is a it's a recent one. Uh, people in Bangalore have built it. I was talking to them. Again, a very good solution and then gives you this decent price store. So if it's a decent price store, I'll trust it a little bit more, right? So that is one. And the second is it has now well-defined standards. So if you look across you know NFT standards. It has come to the stage that every typical blockchain protocol has defined how the NFT should be, which means A, how it will be structured in terms of what data it should carry. Second is what are the minimum fields and the optional fields as well. So as a minimum, you have to have three to four things in every NFT, which is the name, a short description, a link, which is a decentralized link to that, right, in a storage or the actual media, and then some various attributes, right? And of course, along with that goes the ownership data as well. So every time a transfer, you know, it goes to him, it goes to him, it comes to me, it goes to him. You see that ownership gets done and you are referencing the same decentralized link that you had in the first place, right? So that is how you know this is the media which is traveled, right? Versus if it was a Google Drive, comes, comes, comes here, first step, I remove the link, I put something as Mickey Mouse and sell it to him, right? And he will never know what the original article was. So that gets done. There is still some challenges to it. Two, two, three things. I can take that media out of this chain. I can put it somewhere else. I can break that link. Today, it is still possible. So, what next comes is digital media rights. People are trying to do that. It's, it's again, it's part of research. If you are smart enough, uh, you can pick up that project. Could be you know, uh, put it to the labs. It will be a very good project because that is something which people try to do. Second thing is on the same marketplace. Like I said, you have an art piece. I can take a print screen of it. I can put it back on the same marketplace. So how does the marketplace detect it's a fake or it's a duplicate? So again, using AI, using machine learning, using image search matches, you can actually detect duplicates, right? And it's again a very, very good area for you guys to think. And actually, if you're interested in using AI and blockchain, you should start looking and building some solutions like this. People will actually marketplaces, popular ones, you know, they'll actually take this solution because that is, so these are some of the other problems also which come with that and people are actually solving. It's not everything is solved yet. So like I said, there's a lot of opportunity if you want to work on the core engineering part of it. These are some of the solutions you'll have to solve. And finally, uh, the other th third piece is your physical assets, right? In India, people are making some, you know, acrylic or canvas or you know, something. Those get converted into a digital form and then they are shipped out or sent. How do you link those two things, right? So a lot of interesting things still to do, right? And, and, and that is especially in the domain of just pure artwork and, and, and those things. So again, thank you. It was a wonderful question.
Okay, you don't get extra samosas by the way. So go ahead. You can actually. You can. Okay, so you can. That's the motivation. <laughs> same mechanism the the nft is just like i say it's a visual representation when you buy a stock or you go through a broker or any of these online trading platforms they give you something like a dmat shares right you get a receipt for something that you have x amount of shares so like i said in the beginning the nft is a visualization of the same that you own something that's it if the nft is not there then you have a blocking transaction you can always go and look it back again bookmark or hyperlink because you can store it somewhere but the NFT in a wallet actually you can say, hey, you know, I have 10,000 shares or 10,000 units of this property. That's the difference. So it's a visualization, it's a great visualization thing to your blockchain transaction, right? In that sense, in this particular example. It can have a nice photo of the building, all the stuff. So even you see, you look at, hey, it's still with me. I've not lost it. That kind of thing. But yes, one to one, the mechanisms of how it actually gets done is, is very, very similar. So would you agree that, you know, NFTs are essentially a visualization? It's actually both. It's actually both. The ownership, because the ownership actually defines, and once you transfer that ownership, that is what with the China example, you know, if you transfer that, you know, part of land piece or you know, or, or real estate to him, saying I've given you the NFT, you can go to the court and say, Hey, you've given me the NFT. This NFT represents the piece of land, so that land belongs to me now. That is what is, you know, in the legal partners, that is something which is uh, still a bit of gap. Yeah. But as soon as people understand it, they recognize that your NFT can represent the underlying asset. And if you have transferred the NFT as a part of a sale deed, the underlying asset should also be transferred. So the ownership document yes. Is yes. That is my view. Three yeah. samosas, sir. Three samosas. You get a lunch and dinner three years ago. Anything from this side, guys? Questions? All good. Market crash. NFT market crash. Yes, it's it's it's, it's good thing. See, everything which starts, you call it a bubble, right? In, in, in early 2000s, there was an internet bubble. Everyone wanted to do an IT job at that point of time. First, people get more realized. So that is what happens. It's a craze. People don't know what it will be. So they just keep buying, buying, buying. At some time, there will be a correction. This is where we are, right? And then people will start talking about examples like these, you know, something which creates more value. So it's it's just how. I mean, end of the day, everyone is greedy. We are all greedy, right? We don't know what it will be, but just let, let's take it and keep it. We'll see what happens tomorrow. It's the same. So there's nothing bad with that. What is good is all the, uh, uh, the, the randomness which was there, that will go away. Only the serious people will be there. And now if you are trying to build a career, build a project, build a startup in this, you will actually have more value. So people will treat you more seriously. If you are doing it at that point, they will say, you're here tomorrow, you'll disappear. That goes. So actually, for you, it's a benefit, right? I would say. It will come. It's coming. You know, a lot of it will come. And, and, and the way I say it is, think about this. I mean, all of you would be driving something, a car, motorbike at some point of time, scooter, whatever, cycle. Now, if your cycles, cars, motorbikes did not have brakes, would you be able to drive it as, as fast? No. You'll be very slow. I don't crash. But the brakes actually help to drive the car faster. They don't help you to stop the car. Now, the regulations are the exact same thing. Once you have regulations, you actually know how much, how far I can go without getting into trouble. So regulations will help you actually do better stuff, get more value out of this. Your customers will trust you more. And that is where regulations help. So with these kind of land projects and you know art transfer rights, you now because some of the artwork you can transfer, but you don't get the copyright to it. So you're like, well, I got bummed out. You know, I did not get anything. I paid so much for this thing. I cannot do anything with it. So when regulations come, it will actually say that if you have transferred the NFT, the underlying rights also go, which today does not exist, right? So it will actually help you, you know, as a as a if you're sitting here, then you are in the right place. So. 
Is there anything? Anyone else? Final thoughts? So I give it to Arun. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> thank you very much, Saurav. So we have a smart token of public change. <laughs> Okay. Uh, we do have multiple goodies, but uh, <laughs> this is a representation, small token of appreciation. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, so thanks, Sarah, again. So up next, we have uh, another speaker with us, Nanju. Nanju. I mean, is, I hope I can call you Nanju. So, so Mr. Nanju is a, uh, I am Bangalore alumnus. Um, he's also alumnus of Bangalore University. And uh, so he has been he has been a role model in this ecosystem in this web three dot space, and uh, I mean he has been a coach, mentor, like, um, whatever you can ask related to your establishment. If you have an idea, you want to know how to go about it, he's the person that you can blindly go to and ask any of your questions. And um, so he has also been very active in the community space outside of his uh, work engagements. So he has been um, organizing hackathons and other events with IASC in Bangalore. And um, yeah, stage is over to you, um, Nanju. His full name is Nanju. Thank you. You are probably so that people can see you. Oh, in the sure. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah, this is good because then you also be able to walk around you. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you. And. Uh, uh, after uh, Saurav. Saurav's uh, presentation, uh, uh, I just want to, uh, uh, I would like to take you from distributed economy. I approach tokenization from distributed economy. I've come to tokenization uh, also from security tokens. I don't really approach tokenization from NFT. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, another, uh, what do you say that? I set the ground first. And uh, how many of you are in distributed economy or uh, lately uh, it's a little more popular as a uh, stakeholder economy? Uh, okay, so uh, this is how I approach. Uh, and uh, maybe this statement also is another thing that I would like to start with as a point of setting the ground. That uh, see, every effort uh, of building a business or investing is about value creation. And uh, what I like most about uh, Peter Thiel's uh, Peter Thiel's approach is that uh, uh, most of us are always working towards creating value. But uh, uh, you know, value realization is one area where we, as particularly Indians, are very poor. Uh, maybe if we, if time permits, I will come back to a, a story about uh, how we, as Indians, approach value realization and how maybe uh, China approaches. If if time permits, we'll come back. So uh, this is a, a generic uh, definition of uh, distributed economy. Uh, idea is that you know every time we talk about business models or any business we approach, we talk about uh, uh, who are the stakeholders. But when it comes down to uh, uh, value realization part, right? Uh, that is where uh, the stakeholders get chopped into very few components. Right? One is a promoter, founder, two investor. And uh, three is uh, uh, usually uh, employees who get addressed. In fact, there are some interesting questions. And I have different take on those responses. So probably we may have the same thing, but from a different perspective. On the ESOPs is another area of how it gets addressed. And uh, obviously the other components get missed out. So maybe we can run quickly so that I thought I can also try to uh, talk about some stories on that part and also discuss on the some of the use cases that are already prevalent. Uh, most of it. I also like to use some statements which makes it easy for us to go over it. So coming again, uh, I just mentioned that we are, I, my personal approach to uh, distributed economy and tokenization is from a point of doing business, right? So uh, we, we always try to look at business model and we always have various business models, I think. Uh, I assume all of you are entrepreneurs here. No? Okay. Uh, okay. I, 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 I sincerely hope all of you uh, will also become entrepreneurs someday because we just need more entrepreneurs. <laughs> and uh, I'll also give you another uh, reason why you should be an entrepreneur. Uh, so, uh, 
see uh, uh, then if you're not an entrepreneur, you can just be family. You would still be familiar with some of the models, but if you're an entrepreneur, you know, most of the time we'll be using multiples of these models in the way we do business, right? We, uh, from a point of monetization, from a point of customer engagement, or sometimes even to just acquire customers, we use some of these models. So, so there are a whole lot of models and essentially that how do we maximize our uh, stakeholders value? That's the whole exercise of picking up, uh, picking or trying to do a mixing of business models. So that is how we approach uh, business models. So that is where we want to uh, bring you more into distributed economy. So just to get the concept clear, you just talked about that question on stocks, right? So this is obviously a very straightforward way of uh, value sharing by the uh, entrepreneurs, right? From a point of keeping their stakeholders together. So uh, there is uh, one particular story all of us are popular. I mean, all of us are familiar with the most popular uh, poster child of uh, ESOPs in India and also globally to an extent, but in India it is mean, anybody wants to? Infosys, right? I mean, uh, the stories of uh, people who became uh, millionaires. Um, I don't know if you know, but I actually know one such person who obviously would not qualify today in the same organization. Let go that. But if you just Google it, Infosys today uh, has got close to 3 lakh crores. Employees, Employee, yeah, so yeah. three lakh employees, and uh, value of Infosys is what hundred billion plus, hundred billion plus. And uh, do you know when was the stocks given out to every employee, including their driver, to um, Pion, as they used to call it those days, to office boy, as we today refer to? No, what is the value of the company? Sorry. 10 billion? No, no, no. I'm asking value. what was the market capital of Infosys? It was nowhere near a billion. Nowhere near a billion. Today, the company is worth 100 billion plus. So, uh, see, the why I'm urging each of you to those who are not entrepreneurs to become entrepreneurs is this is the change entrepreneurs can bring to the world. See, when the entrepreneurs were running, Infosys shared the value of Infosys through the ESOPs with everybody, right? The guy who supplied uh, picked up the used cup out of the table also got it to the driver. Everyone got it. And today they are worth more than 100 times that. And if you Google it, it's about 8,000 people are the, are the current ESOP beneficiaries of Infosys. So uh, this is a big change, right? When uh, investment firm or an investment group runs a business versus founders run a group. That is another reason why uh, we need to be approaching distributed economy and tokenization can help it change because what happens in the ESOP typically is that see it goes out of our pool. As a founder pool, you have to keep us up. But tokenization can change that. So we could just skip it. You all understand it. Yes, we can just skip that. So this is another thing just to Get the context of it, right? Uh, you, you can pretty much read it. I'll just get to this part of it. You know, close to 73% of Uber is today owned by, owned, controlled by financial institutions. See, uh, first thing is anybody from the investment community here? See, uh, investors don't want to be running businesses, right? Investors' intention is never to run a business. Investors' intention is to make better of their investments. But invariably, the, the existing ecosystem of equity-based investment is facilitating exactly the opposite of it. Investors own and control the organization. In fact, in this very company, the co-founder is kept as an non-executive director. Founder is out. Co founders kept as an executive director. I think it's more like they want him around just to have at least one co founder be around. See, uh, this is what happens, and this is what our current ecosystem facilitates. This is all the more reason why we need to be looking at tokenization. I'm just trying to 
give you some cases as why we need it. And uh, so, uh, incidentally, in the presentation, these are all videos. So that's why it looks all frozen. This is PDF for the so uh, this is what we uh, we are talking about, right? Uh, when we approach two other stakeholders, we we tend to map out. This is in one context, right? You can whatever the business you are doing, you try to map out all your touch points. So all your touch points become the stakeholders. So uh, usually we tend to leave out leave out most of the people, and of course, uh, uh, you know, in the manufacturing business, can use this. Uh, currently, uh, it's already underway as uh, something in the in terms of island manufacturing in Germany. Anybody in the manufacturing business here? So, uh, distributed economy is in practice already. It's not just been a concept around, and we're also trying to put it in place, but uh, it's slowly catching up in India. Uh, I'm, I'm also working with a lot of uh, small, uh, medium uh, manufacturing companies and trying to get them to do this. So uh, the same thing is happening. While you look at it, it becomes much more easier. Maybe the last story, if you get time, you'll be able to address that. Okay. If you want to stop at any point of time, you can talk about it. So uh, one of the things we talked about, uh, you were asking the question, right? Uh, see, traditionally, uh, the business has been approached from an equity market. Uh, it's set to like, okay, spending base. One other thing I want to, uh, rather two things I primarily want to highlight here is what is a significant difference from a traditional model and a tokenized. Uh, one being, uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, it's more about uh, ownership and control. The current model. That is what happens, you know, with the investors taking over the company over a period of time because the more equity they gather, they end up owning the company. And today, I think Infosys, all co-founders put together have less than 5-6%, including their family members. So, so that is what happens. And second thing is that the liquidity is locked in, right? So that is a significant difference. And this is another thing where, uh, one is that the reference to ownership based here is that the ownership remains with the founders here. You as a founder can still own and control your company while you are making the liquidity open so that it releases that it gives a lot more flexibility for investor to derive the value out of it. So uh, it would have been really nice to have some web three investors into the conversation because uh, uh, you people should start at least. Uh, have some, have some conversations to know that you know there are a lot of investments happening on tokens only. See, no more uh, equity based funding. Of course, the large firms are doing a hybrid model. They're also taking in some equity, they're also taking in some tokens. I think it's a good model, good practice to happen. And you Correct. Correct. It's a similar concept, but uh, for the limitation we have. But see, a lot of investors are driving uh, Indian startups to Dubai or Singapore because they say that uh, it's highly volatile and it is being volatile, so to speak. Uh, uh, RBI folks or the Ministry of Finance, they they uh, they've been more rhetoric, which is not very positive. So that is what is scaring a lot of these investors to encourage their uh, companies to come here and then we'll fund. So that's what's happening. But uh, uh, but seriously, there is a stronger case for doing business in India. Uh, if you don't have any intention of getting into uh, human trafficking or drug peddling or arms peddling, you don't really have to worry about it. See, uh, it is true that the compliance is not there, but the reality of the business and the world is that compliance follows business. And that's the way it is, right? You know, planes started flying almost 30, 40 years before the aviation loss came in. That's how it is supposed to be, right? You can't have a rule and then invent to fit it in the box. Same thing with the cars. 
Same thing, you know, if you remember, uh, many of you would be familiar that there were strikes about uh, taxi guys protesting. In fact, uh, quite a few states in USA has banned uh, Uber where it came out. That's because we needed separate uh, license to ride, drive a taxi in India. So that got changed. Of course, uh, Uber was more of a poster child of a circular economy. Uh, to an extent, it did great deal of value because uh, I don't know if you have had interactions over a period of time. I remember where people started driving rented cars, then they started owning their own cars. Then they bought another car and got their brother from their village to drive another car in Bangalore. So Uber did contribute to from a circular economy point of view. But where it is self-limited is that if only Uber was, uh, Uber can still do it. If they can only tokenize it. See, they are present across 130, 120 odd countries. And uh, Uber tokens, if that value can be realized with every driver, close to two and a half lakh uh, drivers across the globe who contribute to it, right? All they take home is the miles they drive. But if they can also have that, and best part is that it does not have to go out of out of uh, Uber equity pool, right? It can be a lower way. There are various ways we can actually bring about a uh, security token. But of course, in US, uh, uh, maybe because uh, many of these guys are not driving security tokens, security token itself is uh, 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 not legalized in the uh, US. So that's the unfortunate part. But I think they will come around maybe with the G20, a lot of these things is going to change. So that's what it is. Correct. Uh, it, it's yeah, it's a complex city, but because it's again on the token model, it can be value can still be realized. See, uh, what's happening is that see, most countries like India, uh, uh, there are uh, no utility value for a token. So majority of them recognize it as an instrument of investment. Yeah. So you can always legally have a token. And uh, see, that's where I think uh, uh, we, we all can have 100 or 1,000 or million complaints about the way government of India runs. But they have approached it in a very, very simplified way. It's the best way that could have been approached, which is to say you monetize it, you pay the tax. So pretty much everywhere, in fact, uh, even in... Uh, uh, Dubai, there is no utility token, right? You can't buy, you can't buy a coffee. Like, uh, in fact, people used to do it as a fancy, even in Bangalore, I remember, uh, I remember a friend who, who paid uh, uh, three bitcoins for a coffee in Coromandel, right? I mean, it, it's, it sounds crazy today, but at that time also it sounded crazy because the coffee shop was not sure what they're getting into. But it, it was all... Uh, a game, but today it sounds like that game must be crying. I don't think it happens like that, right? I mean, it's it's just that at point at that point of time, it was a cool thing to do. So, uh, so I think uh, much of these things are uh, already talked about. So we'll just uh, skip this slide. So uh, only uh, difference being in uh, all the previous conversation to here is that uh, I think a lot of these things are better achieved with securitization of tokens. See, uh, securitization demands a lot of compliance and uh, you, you, you know, uh, and it is bound to come in and we need to be a lot more open for it because that's the only way things will get to a much larger scale and uh, things will happen much faster. See, uh, I don't know how many of you remember what was the origin uh, conversation happening at the time of uh, Bitcoin coming in. That who was the major villain portrayed at that point of time? Banks, right? Banks. It was all about banks. And, uh, you know, funnily, I kept watching, waiting that any media will pick up that and talk about it. Do you realize that CBDC has become the biggest bank killer? It's the biggest bank killer. See, everything rests with the central bank, the Reserve Bank in India case. 
the banks are completely i mean it's open to any any of the fintech uh, players here this is going to be another financial services company competing with anybody else of course uh, uh, i think uh, part partly they will still have a lot of code because uh, the world will not become completely digital rupee because it will also be a e rupee and we will be in a multi token economy so we will also have physical rupee and that is where the banks will try to hold some relevance but since uh, much of the international transfer will move to uh, digital currency so that will weaken most of the banks uh, share so any of you are holding stocks and banking so probably it's you can enjoy it for another year or so at least so so that is where the power shift is happening so that is where uh, i think it's a much stronger case from a securitization of tokens can we move to the next day that's it. we been talking about the same thing uh, i think uh, we'll talk we'll move further so here is a few things i want to talk about right uh, one is for uh, entrepreneurs what's in it and for businesses what's in it we already spoke uh, in brief but uh, but uh, but uh, High level, uh, see, this has to be viewed in the context of what I've been talking about as a distributed economy with tokenization. So, distributed gives the scale. So, that is where we are able to roll out multiple products. So, uh, the context of uh, uh, manufacturing, I was telling you, right? So, if you have to set up a, um, let's, let's talk about this Ola, right? Ola has built one world's largest factory. I mean, this is this is the uh, China model, right? This is what China did 50 years ago. They created one of the largest factories for everything, and today they have started suffering. Uh, not just with that, because there are various other problems. Their coal dependency, which upset, which got upset because of uh, uh, COVID, the coals didn't come in, so which led to their electricity problems, which led to asking their factories, which were running 24/7, to work on one shift instead of three shifts and even one shift had to run uh, alternate days so effectively imagine the factories which were centralized running 24 7 were forced to run eight hours a day instead of 24 hours a day and run three days a week instead of seven days a week. so all these things created so much of problem and in fact many of the companies have got some of these uh, regional governments in germany started looking at it almost four five years ago they started working towards island manufacturing. So essentially, they were looking at creating supply chain ecosystem locally for Germany. And they wanted to reduce the dependency on China. COVID obviously amplified it. And if we in India start taking it on, it becomes much faster for them. Like uh, Ola today trying to set up a centralized factory. If they were to create uh, islands or uh, or uh, hubs of manufacturing across India, right? If they do a distributed model, the whole value creation will be much higher. And also the problem they got in, right? With uh, getting into uh, bringing in a sleek design for a bike. Uh, I think I'll deviate get into the e-bike problems. But uh, there are a whole lot of those problems they got into with the centralized could be much more easily at, you know, addressed through a distributed model. So that is where we employ distributed economy model with tokenization, scale, and a much faster scale, and better monetization, and uh, better value creation, and most importantly, value realization across the stakeholders. So that's what is possible. So um, few case studies. Uh, I just want to highlight this. Some of you are familiar with this. Uh, how much time do we have? I mean, you can take a few more minutes. Some... Okay. So your question on the art, right? See, interestingly, there's a company in uh, Switzerland. So what they have done is that they don't approach art with NFT, right? They call it art security tokens, but they're primarily working on a DLT model, right? They are not working on any particular uh, blockchain technology that is currently in place because they want to have built their own proprietary approach to it. And they have also partnered with the bank. See, that actually addresses 
most of the problems otherwise the system has. So the bank becomes a, a bank has an ecosystem infrastructure, technology infrastructure as well. So it is centralized. They keep the hardware, like how the uh, money is kept in the reserve bank. So the art is kept in the reserve bank or in the bank, and then it is tokenized and multiple ownership is facilitated. Ownership from a token aspect. So you don't own the art and you derive the value of the art and your interest. Getting it? That's the first statement of Peter Thiel we talked about, right? So this is just not about value creation, it's also about value realization. And it is best achievable through tokenization. And in fact, these guys are already doing it. And funny, their name is something like uh, uh, art. Um, it's got a Indian tone to it. It's 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 really funny. I uh, I when he was talking about it, when you was were asking, I just looked up. But uh, I have a short memory for name, so I forgot. <laughs> So, uh, Art Mandi, I mean, that's how it sounds. It could be Art Mandi because it's uh, uh, Swiss French, right? A R T E M U N D I. If you want to Google it, it's very interesting. And they are actually managing about 220 plus million dollar asset, which is essentially a number. So, uh, they claim they are the only one. I think a few more. So, that's where I put this. Pays less than one billion in somewhere around 500, five, six, 600 million size. See, this is very interesting. If you look at it, the whole ecosystem of tokenization is less than two years, not from an aspect of NFT, from an aspect of tokenization and securitization of assets. See, there are companies doing it in gaming. Gaming is the biggest business, having a lot of traction. In fact, there are a lot of Indians who are into it. And I'm sure all of you are familiar with the uh, 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 pay to play, yeah. right? So that's big, and most of it is happening through that. And uh, real estate, uh, there are a lot of uh, good fractional ownership is also come to India. But uh, see, if you look at it, fractional ownership, there is a misnomer. There is no ownership per se. It's a fractional value realization of your investment through real estate. So you don't own it. It's like uh, which is that uh, Singapore squash from. Uh, the thing. It's got that smoky thing. It's, it's a fantastic single model. So every time you buy a bottle, you get a certificate that you get one square feet of land in Scotland. Guinness. Guinness. Sorry. Guinness. Not Guinness. Not Guinness. Uh, that's uh, Irish. Uh, I'm forgetting the name. Anyway, if you are into uh, uh, single model, you should try that. But at least for a fancy of having a one square feet of land. So it's only a fancy aspect of it. So here also, it's more about that. So you don't own it, but you get to realize the value. And uh, I think that's the best part of tokenization. I would like to uh, uh, talk about the last value realization that we have. Or should we? You can take two, three more minutes. Okay. Any questions or should I tell you the story of India's value realization? Yeah. Okay, uh, see, uh, our was not familiar with Poppy Day, Cafe Coffee. So, one of the investors was uh, usually I get pardon to help them with the, their invest, invested company for a, for a scalable model. So, they wanted me to look at one of the investments into the coffee space. And that's when I started actually looking into coffee, what's happening in India, what's happening elsewhere. This was around 2018. And uh, Cafe Coffee Day had 2,200 plus store. Uh, across India and five more countries outside of India. And uh, all of us are familiar, right? Unfortunate incidents has got more people to know about Siddharth's assets. So there was 14,000 coffee, 14,000 acres of coffee estate, which was a captive supply to CCP. So it's an amazing thing, right? You start a business and any raw material you want or the core of your supply, you have a captive supply. So it's like a crazy value you should have. And anybody can you want to guess what was the value of coffee day in 2018? I don't have the exact figure approximately. So throw in some number. Sorry. Uh, it was around 800 million dollars. So how much is that? How much? 
How much is that? So, uh, sorry. I, I I really like to talk in code languages better, but unfortunately, you know, when you deal with some investor community, you end up doing this million nonsense. So anyway, so eight hundred million dollars. Six thousand six hundred. Okay, today's value. Okay, so uh, that's still significant. It's not bad, but uh, around the same time, there was a coffee uh, startup called Luckin Coffee in China. Any of you familiar with that? See, Luckin was one of the fast-growing coffee business, coffee uh, cafe model in China. And in 2018, they were opening one cafe every 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes. And by late 2018 or early 2019, they were supposed to block 2,000 stores. And as of 2018, at the time I was looking into it, they had zero investment in any of the coffee estates. They didn't own anything. So they were buying from third party. And mind you, China got into coffee for the last 20 odd years. Since the time Starbucks entered and since the time most Chinese started traveling outside is when they got introduced to coffee. Unlike India, we got introduced to coffee almost 350 years ago. Right? So, and we also started growing, but we believe that we own coffee today. But it's, we are all immigrants, right? Coffee is also. So 350 year old history, so which is good. And still, you know, if you remember, you go to anywhere outside of Bangalore, you get shitty coffee. That's how it is. Right? So imagine rest of India, much of North India, you don't even ask for coffee, right? You prefer chai because that's how it is. That's India. And China just getting in. And lucking coffee with these things. Any guesses on the valuation this time in dollars, please? Just throw a number, it's okay. Yeah, the, the way I'm putting it up, right? It was $4 billion, isn't it? Just imagine so much of value here, and it was $800 billion, and in a market which is not even comparable to India from a consumption point of view, and supplies dependent on third party suppliers. Right? They were actually buying through traders. So imagine the rate at which a coffee day could get coffee and lucky. And in the market. And despite all that, lucky was valued at four billion dollars. See the uh, one one thing uh, I'm not directly contextual in any environment, but see, you as a startup entrepreneur have to start realizing from a point of value realization. And obviously, tokenization can give you amplify the whole realization aspect of it. That's why, no matter what business you do, look at tokenization. And uh, and you know, one other good part of tokenization is that uh, if Siddharth was alive, we could have probably got him to think about tokenization. So uh, so thing is, you don't have to organically plan that. It is designed and built that. So that's what makes it a lot more easy to go over it. Thank you. Any, any? All right. Thanks again. No, sorry. I switched off. Oh, no, that's fine. So um, again, we were very grateful for you. I mean, these are thought processes that we want. We, we need entrepreneurs in India. We need job. Uh, we, we need us to think in that direction and web3 is a web3 is a great gateway for us to enter into that that uh, uh, mode of entrepreneurial journey right so uh, yeah it was inspirational we will definitely like to invite you further for more such sessions and but for now uh, here is small token of the so for all the participants who are in person here uh, we will be taking a break now um, so we'll be taking a break and we will be collaborating or joining all the virtual rooms back in, uh, and we will be joining the main room in, in some time. So for now, um, until 2 p.m., I think we all can take break. And once we are back at 2 p.m., we have a panel discussion, which is again going to be hybrid. We have 
panelists present in Kerala, Noida, virtual as as well, right? So um, we'll take a small break now. And we'll join back at two o'clock. We'll leave the Zoom call recording on, and we'll leave the Zoom on. So, yeah, I believe there is the session in Noida still going on. The I guess the Kerala session is done, and the virtual sessions are done. Guys, we have already done for all of the events. It's just going to take another 10 minutes. And then we'll be very, very happy.